And welcome to Faith and Victory Church, first service of the year. Good to see you all this morning. We're happy to have you. Um, due to circumstances beyond our control, uh, both of our worship people are not here uh, today. And so we are not going to have worship. And we, uh, op- we did consider the option of me leading, and we just thought we'd go straight into the Word. <laughs> Some things are better than others. All righty. And so, um, praise the Lord, we're happy to have you. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas and a wonderful New Year. Um, and our announcement is that, you know, Shannon and uh, Dennis got engaged this summer. Um, and, um, but Nathan got engaged on New Year's Day. Um, both of them did their uh, proposals at the Biltmore. And uh, so, by the end of this year, we will be empty nesters. Hallelujah. And... Um, I just don't know if I can handle it. I'm just messing. They're not here to defend themselves. All righty. Praise God. Let's all, um, let's all stand up for just a second and thank God for his goodness, mercies. How do the Father, we honor and we bless you. We thank you for our time together here um, in the word of God and in uh, joining together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you, Father, that the Word of God will bring light and illumination to us. And as we begin to teach along the lines we're, we're going, um, that you know, revelation will come. We will grow in Christ, and we will be, uh, make us stronger and, and better in the things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn around and look at somebody and say, so good to see you. Happy New Year. Glory to God. You may be seated now. Uh, and go ahead and open your Bibles, if you will, to the second book of Peter. Hallelujah. We'll be reading the first through the eleventh verses. We're starting a new series. Hallelujah. Uh, we will read it from the King James, and then we will read it from the J.B. Phillips. Hallelujah. That's right. You guys go, go right ahead on. There we go. There's, there's no delay here today. Uh, we'll be done earlier than normal just because we will be. <laughs> Hallelujah. All righty. So we're beginning a series on Christian character. Christian character. Hallelujah. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Um, or um, World's Notes says, the new life in Christ and godliness as the outward expression of that life. Okay? Of life and godliness through the knowledge of him uh, that has called us to glory and virtue. Now, the word knowledge in both these places is gnosis, meaning um, Accurate, experiential knowledge. It's not just an intellectual adherence to. It is you have experienced, okay, through the experiential knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. According as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life. Did I just jump backwards? I'm sorry. Uh, through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and to virtue. Hallelujah. Uh, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, all effort. This is not just a, you know, haphazard approach. This is a purposeful, meaningful you need to do this. Um, some of the teachings we've had along the lines of uh, what we would refer to as, as Brother Bill calls it, greasy grace, or you know, excessive teachings on grace means things are just going to happen to you with no, with nothing you do. You know, it's just going to happen. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be prosperous. You're going to uh, just suddenly have everything in the world just because the grace is there. And it's, and here he says, with all diligence, okay. He says, with all diligence, add to your faith. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, 
to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that, um, that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me read to you from the Philip's translation of this passage. I just like the way it said certain things. Simon Peter, a servant and messenger of Jesus Christ, sends this letter to those who begin giving a faith as valuable as yours in the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May ye know more and more of grace and peace as your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord grows deeper. God has done his part. See that you do yours. I just like that statement. Hallelujah. He has, by his own action, given us, given us everything that is necessary for living the truly good life in allowing us to know the one who has called us to him through his own glorious goodness. It is through him that God's greatest and most precious promises have become available to us men, making it possible for you to escape the inevitable disintegration that lust produces in the world and to share in God's essential nature. For this very reason, you must do your utmost from your side and see that your faith carries with it real goodness of life. That's virtue. Hallelujah. Your goodness must be accompanied by knowledge. Again, gnosis, okay? That experiential knowledge. Your knowledge by self-control or temperance. Your self-control by the ability to endure patience. Your endurance must also... Um, your endurance must also be accompanied by brotherliness. Now, Philadelphian comes from the Greek word Philadelphia, okay, brotherly love, that must lead on to Christian love, agape, agapian, actually is the Greek word here. If you have these qualities existing and growing in you, then it means that knowing our Lord Jesus Christ has not made your lives either complacent or unproductive. The man whose life fall, fails to exhibit these qualities is short-sighted. He can no longer see the reason why he was cleansed from his former sins. Set your minds then on, in, uh, on endorsing by your conduct the fact that God has called you and chosen you. If you go along the lines I have indicated above, there is no reason why you should stumble and if you live the sort of life I have recommended, God will open wide to you the gates of the eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And so Peter begins this second letter um, with addressing character issues, really. All right. Now, five of them deal with our relationships with people. Two of them deal with God. Okay. Uh, our relationship with God. And so when we begin to study this and look at this, now one of the things that you need to understand is there's, this is not an order, you know, virtue, this, that. There's not some order you do it in. Okay, I got to get the virtue. Then I got to get this. Then I got to get that. It's not a set order. It is um, they are all there and they all need to be cultivated in our life. Amen. Not just in a, and not, it doesn't have to be in a set order, you know. I mean, in other words, if you're developing um, self-control, it doesn't mean that you're out of line because you didn't get virtue done yet. Okay? This is not a step, 
you know, okay, faith, then virtue, then this. And you, and you just kind of like got these steps I got to take to get here, and they got to be done in that order. All right? That's not, what that's not the, the construct of the Greek. It's not what it's trying to say. It's, but it is, you know, and you got to understand, we're talking about Greek to English, we're talking about a translation. Um, sometimes the, the form that was used doesn't fully convey what the Greek was trying to say. Um, and then we, if, we don't, if we don't do a little study, um, you, you'll misconstrue what was being said. So don't think you've got to do it in a specific order, whatever, okay? But we are talking about developing Christian character. There's some things that Peter says here in this first part. Um, you know, according to his divine nature, has given, us, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But how do we get that? How? how? Through the knowledge you will not ascertain or walk in the light of the benefits of life and godliness, this new life in Christ, and the godliness, which is an outward example of that inner working, without knowing. Now, not, not, just, not just being saved. Without having an experiential, intimate, accurate knowledge of Christ. Remember again, this gnosis is not just an intellectual adherence to Okay, gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, um, that is the, uh, the verb, the, um, the noun is epinosis, okay, um, and so, you know, knowledge, okay, um, in that sense, in, in a noun form, that knowledge, so the gnosis, epinosis, that clear, precise, accurate, intimate, experiential knowledge, you must have that experiential knowledge of him. You got to know Christ. Not be born, just born again. You have to be, you have to know him. That comes through what? Well, he says here later, he goes on and says, um, whereby, what? He says that this life and godliness comes through the gnosis of God, amen, who called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us, what? Exceeding great and precious promises that by these, ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Amen. Again, gnosis. Again, experiential knowledge. That comes from the Word of God. Can you say hallelujah? I mean, it comes out of the Word of God. I'm trying to think. There's a couple things I had put in my, um, in my notes here. That in the uh, Yeah, we'll go back and get those. All right. So, Peter's saying... <clears throat> now, how many are glad you're born again? Three people are glad. Four, five, six. Jesse, your husband's not glad he's born again. Okay, all right. Belinda, did you wave your hand? Okay. Hallelujah. See, we have faith, faith that assurance, that, um, you know, piston, belief, persuasion, assurance. Believers have shared and um, received the like precious faith. That like, that like precious faith is um, similarly similar, precious, of equal value or privilege that the, the apostles had received. We've received it. We have a faith. And there's a lot of people who think, because I believe in God and I'm born again, that's all there is. Okay? And it's important. I mean, without that, you can't even go forward. You got to believe in God. They that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, for they that cometh to Him must believe that He is, and that He's the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We have to have faith in God. Can you say hallelujah? And, uh, and, we, and, and then again, in our circles, we call Word of Faith churches, charismatic Word of Faith. Neo-Pentecostalism, hallelujah, a bunch of terms are used, um, glory to God, um, that we, when we measure on faith, and a lot of times, every time we hear that word, we think we're talking about believing we got something from God. You know, we're believing for healing, we're believing for a car, we're believing for, you know, prosperity, we're believing to be delivered, we're believing for this, we're, and, and that is an aspect of it, but it's not the only aspect of faith. Because, see, there's not only using the faith of God 
or the God kind of faith. There is, first and foremost, faith in God. Amen. Because faith in God precedes being able to use the faith of God. Y'all hear you going home. But in our circles, we've preached so many sermons on Mark eleven twenty three, and we've preached so many sermons on uh, Hebrews 11 uh, that, you know, we, sometimes we just automatically drift over to that, believing, using our faith to get things from God, the prayer of believing and receiving, which is a part of the Bible. But we, get, we also have to back up a step. Now, wait a second. Here, Peter's not talking about believing that you receive. He's talking about your, your confidence, your assurance, your belief in God. Amen. All believers have that. You can't be a believer without it. Amen. Brother Bill. That was a week. Thank you, Brother Bill. All right. Brother Bill just needs me to make sure he's resounding with me here. Glory to God. So, this, this faith, um, we receive this, this assurance through the righteousness at the, and justification, innocence applied to all without partiality of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. When you got born again, now you have this assurance. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are what? The children of God. Can you say amen? So part of our, our, our virtues as a believer, one of them is faith. Characteristics. What characterizes us? We believe. Now, I know you've met some unbelieving believers before. What do you mean about that? There's, you know, that's, that gets over onto that believing and receiving and speaking the word of God and acting like you actually believe God says what he said, meant and meant what he said and will do what he said. Instead of, you never know what God's going to do. I do! What's he going to do? What he said he would do. <clears throat> Amen. That's part of my assurance in him. That his word is true. That he cannot lie. He's not a man that he can lie. Amen. And so, um, Peter kind of approaches this as the um, somewhat. That... Faith is a known for a believer. It's, it's, you know, we're believers. We're born again. We believe God. Hallelujah. Woo! Jesus is my Lord. <clears throat> like I said a couple weeks ago, dear, sweet, older African-American lady, she had to be in her 80s. I was walking up the grocery store, and I looked at her because I was pushing my cart over to put it in the corral, and uh, I said, how are you doing? She said, fine. And I was, walk, I was going to walk on by. She said, before you walk by, can I pray with you and introduce you to Jesus? <laughs> I said, man, I'm already born again, but thank you for your faithfulness to share the gospel and be a witness for him. I knew you were so sweet you had to be. <laughs> hey, well, bless you, mama. You go ahead on and keep sharing Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. But the one thing in common to all of us that we call believers is faith. So Peter kind of approaches this and builds from the pinnacle that we already are filled with faith. We're believers. Amen. But there's more to your growth and your walk with God and your example as a believer than just believing that he is and having faith in him. Somebody shout hallelujah. <clears throat> so he moves on from there and, and then he talks about um, how that he's given us he's, he's, um, all things that pertain to life and godliness um, through the knowledge. Again, we said, we've already said this, gnosis of him that called you to glory and virtue or by his own glorious uh, splendor. Much translation. You know, I've read about eight translations reading this, looking to see if there's anything said a different way or you know, giving a, a cleaner or more um, understandable view in considering our language of today versus the language of the time. Okay? 
And um, that kind of comes across as his own glorious splendor, by his own glorious splendor. Whereby are giving exceeding great and precious promises. What's that? The word. I said the word. I said the word. Can you say amen? The word of God. Hallelujah. And so the word of God, that by these you might be partakers. What? You might be partakers of the divine nature. Oh my. Listen to what Peter says here. See, we hadn't even got down into the, really got down into the uh, other virtues or, or characters, characteristics. Here he says that by these exceeding great and precious promises, we partake of the divine nature. Now, I'm going to say something. You need to partake of the divine nature. That was about as weak of a first Sunday of a new year service, amen, I've heard. We need to be partakers of the divine nature. All right, that's better. Hallelujah. And we do that through the exceeding great and precious promises. See, they carry with them the knowledge of God, the understanding of God. And as we walk with him and spend time with him and act on his word, we what? We have a gnosis with him. We have experience. Am I still in the camera? All right. So I'm better here. All right. I was stretched. I was... I got that wide face like they did in Star Trek. Um, Y'all ever see that one where they get the stretching on the face? Uh, anyway, forget it. Hallelujah. These promises, the word of God, the word of life, as we partake of that, we're partaking of his nature. Through acting on the word, living on the word, living by the word, what happens? We have the experiential knowledge of God. Not just, well, the Bible says, okay, that's great. Okay, the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it. And, uh, you know, I used to say, you know, the Bible says it, that settles it. Okay, that settles it as far as eternity is concerned. But for us personally, we have to act on it. Okay, and it's not just so an, inte an intellectual adherence is not good enough. You know, well, uh. I think I about got it figured out. Whoopee. So we're not looking for you to get it figured out. We're just looking for you to experience it. He said that by these exceeding great and precious promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature, having given, um, through, um, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Amen. But we got all this through the knowledge of him. Our faith in God is the doorway into experiencing Him and, and experiencing a gnosis. I'm not trying to be fancy and try to show you I can, I got a concordance. I can read a concordance, okay, and do word studies with, you know, Greek um, commentaries, all right, and I've got a bunch of them. And, you know, you, we, you can go back and study those and uh, you, can, you can pick up this information so it's not like I'm some kind of, you know, the third Greek scholar in the world or anything, but I can read. Okay? And those who are way, 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 way smarter than me have done all that work. I just like to use their fruits. Amen. Hallelujah. Am I right, Brother Bill? Hallelujah. And so um, these great and precious promises, as we are believers... We're experiencing God, and it helps us or empowers us. I believe, I believe Philip says something along the lines of empowering us to escape the corruption that is in the world. See, if you think you're just going to walk away from the corruption that's in the world with no effort on your part, you're sadly mistaken. There must be an empowerment that takes place in you. Come on now. How? through the exceeding great and precious promises, through the word of God, in experiencing God. That empowers you. There's an empowerment that takes place through this process. Now, we call it the renewing of the mind. There's a lot of things we call this, you know, <clears throat> be not conformed to this world, shaped, molded, fashioned, 
but be ye transformed, metamorpho. Bet you can't figure out what that word is in English. The metamorpho. It's a root for metamorphosis, okay, um, of the renewing of our minds. The Word of God, James says, receive with meekness the engrafted Word, which is able to uh, suke, I mean, sozo your suke, save your soul, your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotion. There's a transformation that takes place. Amen. And as that knowledge of God comes, it's a spiritual knowledge. I said it is a spiritual knowledge. Administered by the teacher, the Holy Ghost, so that you understand God, not intellectually as much as you are, but it's spiritually. And you experience him. And as you experience him, Peter comes up back after all that and telling you to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now the word lust <coughs> is um, translated desire in other places, usually translated in the Greek New Testament in light of um, inordinate affections or lustful affections, carnal affections, is translated sometimes to mean strong desire for the things of God. It's really contextual determines its, its, its meaning as far as what it's, but it means strong desire. See, you can have a strong desire for uh, a woman that's not your wife, and that's wrong. You could turn right around and use that word to say you have a strong desire for the things of God, and it's right. Okay? But it's usually used in the Greek New Testament to re represent fleshly, carnal, fle uh, wrong desires. Hold your place over here in 2 Peter and run real quick over to Galatians. Hey, Frank, how you doing, brother? My, my friend Frank, if it was, hallelujah. <clears throat> now, he says here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Same Greek word, lust, desire. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do what you would. Now, I would submit to you here, and I understand that in the Greek there was a capitalization. So when it comes here, you could either mean Holy Spirit or the human spirit. And I really, because of the way he talks about it here, I would submit to you he's talking about the human spirit. The flesh works against the recreated human spirit. You're in a battle. The flesh is not in a battle with the Holy Ghost. It's in a battle with your spirit who wants to follow after God. Now, I'm not rewriting the Bible. They just put it in because they thought it was meant Holy Spirit. They have really no way other, other than read, reading and, and deciding if it was the Holy Spirit or whatever. So let's read it that way. For the flesh lusteth against the recreated human spirit, and the recreated human spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another. Now, in light of Paul's writings in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, which one do you think he's talking about here, Holy Spirit or human spirit? See, when you take Romans, Romans and compare it here, then Paul bat the battle was between the human spirit and the flesh Paul was talking about. That which I would do, I don't do. That which I don't do, I would do. And, you know, uh, who's going to deliver me from this body of sin? I'll thank God. <laughs> I mean, Paul's schizophrenic chapter. Hallelujah. It's not really schizophrenic. He's talking about the battle that's going on, and it's really simplified here in Galatians. The flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. I missed my amen corner over there. All right, I was waiting for Brother Bill to... Oh. These are contrary one to the other, so that you uh, cannot do the things that you would. Amen? But if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Now these is not in the Greek. Okay? So this is it. Which are? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, 
heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and such like. So this wasn't a complete list. This, might, you know, this is the top few. And anything else that really caters to the flesh over the spirit. Amen. Anything that caters to the flesh over the spirit. <clears throat> of which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things, now the Greek is practice. Habitually practice. Not you did it. I mean, like growing, now growing, look, growing up classical Pentecostal, they are Armenian in theology. What? You sin, you're lost, you got to get saved again. If Jesus came back right after you cussed because somebody stepped on your foot, you're dying and going to hell because you didn't get a chance to repent and get that right before God before Jesus showed up. Which is the opposite and extreme of Calvinism. It don't matter what you do, you're going to heaven. So people ask me, what are you? I said, I'm a Calvinist. I'm somewhere in between. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm between the two extremes. All right? I do believe, as a believer, you can lose your salvation. I believe Hebrews, Hebrews makes that very clear. Hebrews 6. However, it's not easy. It's not you make one mistake and you're out the door. Okay? So, he said, they that practice habitually doing such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is, and again, I would submit to you, this is the recreated human spirit. Because it is our spirits that bear fruit. The Holy Spirit doesn't bear fruit. Our spirit bears fruit. What did Jesus say? I would that ye what? Bear much fruit. All right? It's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, or faithfulness. Uh, that really is what they should say there. Meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts, or strong, inordinate desires. Hallelujah. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay, so we, we're back here now. And how, how many are still in Peter now? Or did y'all lose your place? Go back to Peter. Our second, second Peter 1. I, I took my finger right out and, and lost it. I had to go back and find it. He says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And we just read what that was. The works of the flesh. All that stuff and such like. Now what empowers us to escape that? Come on. This is, this is not a trick question. Come on. Right, these exceeding great and precious promises empowering us to develop Christian character and bear the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. So as a believer, see, too often times we leave everything up to, well, God's in control, God's going to do it. Really? He's not going to tithe for you. He is not going to crazy glue your lips together. Although I am sure there are days he wishes he would. Hello. When we were camping one year and Janie was, um, Janie was trying to fix a broken fingernail. And she squirted out too much crazy glue and it got between her fingers and got stuck. And she didn't have any acetone. So I'm riding through the campground asking, y'all yeah, got any acetone? Anybody got any acetone? My wife stuck her fingers together. She can't get them apart. People next day, you know, people that remember, remember seeing me the night before going, how's your wife? How's your wife? You know, like, are you doing Spock? Oh, no, you're, you're making fun of the fact. I mean, I finally went to the store somewhere and found some. We got our fingers apart. Hallelujah. Um, 
How come I got? Oh, but some, some people need their mouth crazy glued together. Because that gets you in more trouble than anything. Hello? But by partaking of the divine nature, we will cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. Can you say amen? amen? And escape the corruption that is in this world through lust. So as a believer, we are given responsibilities to grow. To grow in Christ. Now, it's not as exciting as a this is your year sermon on the first Sunday of January, is it? Not as exciting as, you know, you're going to have more in this year and you're going, to be, you're going to be blessed. You're going to go to bed tomorrow and wake up a millionaire the next day. You know, whoever takes that word will receive it. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not mocking prophecy. I am, well, sometimes it's not prophecy. It's, it's people just make this stuff up. Holy Ghost didn't even say it. They just... They wanted to inspire people, and they get big offerings because people got inspired. I like people to be inspired too. But let's be inspired. If it's, going to be, if it's going to be prophecy, let it be prophecy and not you made it up in your head. Let it be the Holy Ghost, not something you dreamed up. You know? I, I, I didn't put it out there. I was going to, and I thought, no, I'm going to start a firefight right here on Facebook. I really thought about doing it, though. I wanted to put up so bad. That if you are sitting out there looking at the calendar and thinking that at midnight of Thursday, everything's going to be hunk-a-dory from that point forward, you got your faith in the wrong thing. Because the calendar doesn't change your life. The exceeding great and precious promises of God's Word does. If you are not diligent on December 31st, you are not going to be diligent the next morning. These are characters that are built. These are characters that are developed. Hello. And it doesn't happen instantly. These are, these are things that, you, you know, he even says here, as we read earlier, to give all diligence to it. Amen? I mean, we're talking about adding diligence. Woo! That just gets excited. People excited when you start talking about diligence, don't it? doesn't it? Huh? I'm waiting for somebody to talk to me out there. Yeah. Yeah, with all diligence. Yeah. And we're to, which means um, carefulness or intense effort. I'm not going to try to pronounce the Greek word. Spoden. Eh, spoden. Not, not, not that bad. Careful and intense effort. See, if you're going to develop in Christ, there's going to have to be a part you play. And stop buying some book that's going to tell you you're going to get it and you don't have to do anything because that's works. Now, that book is stupidity. I'm sorry. It, Brother Hagin used to go around and say, some folks think, you know, because of what we preach, that, you know, they're going to go through life on the flowery beds of ease and the blessings of God are going to fall on them like ripe cherries off a tree. And he was saying that 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And people still didn't get it. And he said, they're sadly mistaken. Hello? Blessings of God don't fall on you like ripe cherries off a tree. Hello? You're not going through life on flowery beds of ease. Fight the good fight of faith. You're going to face circumstances. When you read Paul over in um, <clears throat> either 1st or 2nd Corinthians, I think the 11th chapter, of all the stuff he went through, Day and night in the deep. And, you know, and thrice was I beaten with 40 stripes, save one. You know, uh, the, I mean, he just goes on. And perils of my city, of uh, my kinsmen. Perils in the heathen. Perils in the country. Perils in the city. Besides all that, I mean, he just, he goes on a list a whole bunch of stuff. But then Paul proclaims in the Romans, we're more than conquerors. We're going to face battles. Now, if you were a good Baptist growing up, you always wanted to sing about Canaan land. Am I right, Brother Bill? Brother Bill was good. He was a Baptist with a D. That's a different kind. Isn't that right, Brother Bill? Yeah. 
Glory to God. Thank God for the Baptists. If we're going for the Baptists, most of you Pentecostals wouldn't be saved. That's the truth. Are you here? <laughs> Glory to God. Um, they were singing about Canaan land and think of it as heaven. It can't be a type of heaven. There's giants in the land. When they went into Canaan, there were giants. They had to conquer mountains. No, Canaan land is a type of the new birth. Where we are born again, we're the true people of God, but we've got to win the battles and possess the land. The, everything, that they, everything they did, they had to go possess it. Hello? It just wasn't laying there for, them, for, the, for the picking. They had to go win the battles. <clears throat> so it's not, it can't be a type of heaven. There are no enemies in heaven. There's no battles in heaven. Are you here? You've gone home. Y'all do know this is my introduction to the series. Okay, today is kind of the introduction to it. We may get to one of them, I don't know, um, past faith, but we're, we're working our way down. Hello. And so we need to understand that, that this diligence, this intense effort, this carefulness, that we, are to in, that we are to enter into as a believer because we have our confidence, we have our assurance, we have our persuasion in Christ, and that by his word we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust, and by his word we develop the character of Christ within us so that we are able to fulfill our purpose as a believer. Amen. And so, um, let's look maybe, let's, go, let's, let's look down. 1 commentary said this, that Peter said that the believers are not to try to just hold their faith, to make it to heaven. Going to get there somehow, some way. Going to slide in the pearly gates. Going to make it by the skin of your teeth. We should not be satisfied with, I got saved, I'm going to heaven, and now I'm tying the rock, rope, a knot at the bottom rope, hanging on to the end. Number one, your effectiveness as a believer is greatly diminished with that mindset. What do you mean my effectiveness? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. If you got a knot tied at the bottom rope, you're just hanging on, you ain't doing none of that. Now, let me say this. I've had um, one phone call, and I've had um, someone else talk about and share the, uh, about a stirring of revival because, quite frankly, the church has gained, and particularly the American church, has become complacent. And we became satisfied with Oh, we're doing all right. Now, let me say this. I mean, you know, listen, we just came out of um, um, 2020. And financially, as a church, we're sitting good. The best we've been in 15, 20 years. Now, we got money set aside. Did y'all see it? Did y'all go on and look? Have y'all shared the thing lately? The GoFundMe? There was enough money in, in, left over the end of the month. For December, we bumped it on up to 20000 in the building fund. We hit the 20000 mark. Well, that just means we need 40000 more. Hallelujah. And there's you know, been some suggestions, maybe kind of doing like we did with the debt destruction, is getting people to recommit now to giving towards the building fund in a, in a, in a manner which will cause it to increase. Hallelujah. To get us in that position to get the building. What happens if they sell that one before we get to it? We'll go get a different one. But we got to be moving in that direction. We really do. And we got to be moving in there with our faith and with our money. Hallelujah. Not just, you know, uh, depending on everybody on, on the GoFundMe Facebook to give it. Somebody else, we're going to have to do our part. We did our part with the getting out of debt. In 10 and a half months, we paid off $35,500 uh, and $80 in debt. Now, there was another 3000 and something that was uh, interest during that time because of the, the amount of debt we had. 
but and two churches outside of ours gave about that much. They basically paid the interest on that money for the year. The rest of it came from our church in ten and a half months on an eighteen month plan. So uh, it can be done. Hallelujah. And we, we know that banks want 20%, so we know to get to a th like a $300,000 project building, we've got to have $60,000 on hand to do it and give it up. <clears throat> you got to give it up. You just can't have it in the bank. You got to give it up. Hello. So anyway, all that to say, um, you know, we're believing that we're going we're gonna to move forward in things as believers, but we want to be effective. And anyway, that whole point came up because of this. I've talked to pastor after pastor after pastor after pastor. And they all said about the same thing. We haven't experienced a financial problem this year. With the crazy COVID stuff and everybody staying home. And but they have experienced a lack of desire of people to come to church. Well, pastor, we're still giving. We're giving electronically. We're still, you know. And they're happy because now they're excited that they can stay home in their pajamas and drink their coffee and watch the service. Which is great that we're able to maintain the contact, particularly for people who can't come for whatever reason. Okay? On the other side of that, we need each other. You're not. Now, I'm going to digress from the main theme right now. There is something about us joining together. Even Paul wrote and said, forsake not the assembling together as is the manner of some. We need one another. We need to be together. There, uh, Dad Hagen, back in 19, I believe it was 1990. Now, or 89, I, I'm trying to remember, in 90, 89, or 92, because... Janie was pregnant with either Shannon or Nathan. I can't remember. He held his first minister's conference down at Philip Jackson's church in Charlotte. The very first one he held of all the ones, the first place he did it was at Philip Jackson's in Charlotte. Philip used to, Pastor Jackson used to be our, our regional director until he, you know, he gave that up. Um, but he was our regional director for years, the first one for this region, um, for, for, for Raymond Bennett and Sarah Association. And um, love Pastor. He's awesome. And... Um, <clears throat> But Brother Hagin held that meeting at his church. Well, this is the exact same time Jim Baker was about to be convicted. Y'all know what time frame I'm in now? Okay. <clears throat> you know, for all the shenanigans they did down there at, at, at uh, PTL and the, um, the, uh, the whole village. I forgot what they called the, the whole village. Huh? It was 89. Okay. So 89. So she was pregnant with Shannon. All right. And I remember that so well because they had plastic chairs and Janie short, got short legs and her legs would go to sleep trying to sit in the service and swell. But we were in that meeting. <laughs> she followed me all over the place. Hallelujah. And um, Brother Hagen's in like one of the first or second services and he's talking all of a sudden he stops and says, well, you know, there are some things you just don't pick up on until you're in the vicinity, the physical vicinity. Now, here's Brother Hagen. Everybody thinks, you know, he walks on water, that he knows exactly what's going on in Africa while he's in his living room in Tulsa. And the Spirit of God can do this. These things do happen. But he said there are just some, this, but he's saying this, there are just some things you don't pick up on until you're in the, the actual physical vicinity. Now, he said in regards to Jim Baker, it won't be as bad as it seems. Well, I thought he was going to get off. Well, it wasn't that a week or two later. Maximum Bob is who they called the judge who was head of the case. That was his nickname, Maximum Bob. Because he gave out the maximum penalty on everything. Jaywalking, 20 years. I'm just joking a little bit there. Just a little bit. Well, Jim Baker got 45 years. For the shenanigans they did, they did down there at PTL with the, with the scamming of, you know, raising money to build this tower while they were actually paying off the one that they didn't pay off to start with because they had done something else with that money and they were just floating money. They had 2,000 checking accounts. 
And they're writing checks to one account to the other and floating that money around in circles. Because back then it was like 10 days per float before it was considered a bad check. And so they were just, they had a, they had a house of cards going on. First thing that happened with it when uh, Falwell took over, when Baker at, turned it over to him, was they reduced it to 167. Finally got down to like two from 2,000. But they were floating that money around. So they were showing this new tower they're going to build over here, but they were still paying the tower over here that they didn't pay for because they did something else with the money. Well, that's embezzlement. It's illegal. <clears throat> well, he got 45 years. And, I, and a pastor came to me and said, well, what about it? Brother Hagin said it wouldn't be as bad as it sounded. That's pretty bad. He, basically, he missed it. Except about three years later or four years later, in 94, it was commuted down to time served of five years. That ain't as bad as it sounded like, is it? 45 to 5, that's a whole lot better. Now, my point was, not that, you know, about the whole Jim Baker thing. We all know about it. And I'm not talking about it. It's, it's public. This is all over the news. It's not something, we're, you know, we're not trying to hide it. We're not trying to act like it didn't happen. It happened. 20, 30, 26 years ago, 27, yeah, 25 years ago. This all took place, you know, the, the, the final, you know, the, when he got out. My point is this. Brother Hagin said there's some things you can't really tie into until you're there. There's something about being in a church service. Hello. Physically there. Amen. That God does things and, and, and things are ministered and things are, uh, are picked up on that or would not be picked on necessarily if you weren't there. Well, Pat Robinson, see, Pat Robinson, I, he, you know, he, he's, I know they've done those things on PT, I mean, on the 700 Club for decades, but not everybody flows that way. You know, and I can't, I can't say that's not a gift from God, that he, he flows in the word of knowledge like he does. Hello? I mean, there's been people healed, people, mir 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 miracles taking place. But as a general rule, I'm not usually standing here in this church and get a word for somebody in Tulsa. So it's important we come together. So as we, as we, as we entered into this calendar year, <coughs> and, the, and the Lord just gave me this message, because now remember I finished up healing before um, Christmas, and then on Christmas, the Christmas Sunday, um, I talked about the three R's of 2020. How many watched it? Y'all supposed to watch that. It's only about 25 minutes long, isn't it, Jesse? Go home and go back on Facebook and watch it. It's only 25, 30 minutes long. It's not, not real long. Nathan sang one song, and then I did. I, I was, it was a fireside chat. I got the fire beside me, the Christmas tree over here. I'm sitting in a chair. It's, a, it's literally a fireside chat. Okay? But the Lord dropped this into me about Christian character and our need to grow in some things because we got churches now and, and congregations now that are happy virtual. Now, let me come over here on this side real quick. I'm not playing devil's advocate. I'm, I'm, I'm playing both sides here. Thank God we had the virtual so we can stay in communication with people. But on the other side of this, we can't function as a church long term without coming together. The importance of iron sharpening iron. Amen. Of us being together. Uh, cannot be uh, stated strong enough. Somebody say hallelujah. We must be joined together so that we can bear one another's burdens, pray for one another. I'm going to tell you something. Praying for people remotely. You know, I have to, I have to, I really got to shut my head down. Why? Because I, want, I really want to be able to lay hands on them. I want to be close to them. Amen. Now, we, now we have, 
we have had phenomenal miracles with prayer cloths. But still, again, that's a point of contact. We're actually physically touching something and sending that physical thing to someone. Hello? And to, for me, it just, it, it, I just, I'm, I'm happier when I, if somebody wants me to pray for them. Now, we pray for, well, listen, we had prayed for somebody. Like, a few people yesterday, they, they sent and said, listen, we need prayer. And we said, stop. Jane and I took, stopped prayer. I took hands and prayed and believed God right then. Hallelujah. Um, but still, there's something about being together. And I can't explain it any better than what that is. Is that sometimes you just got to be in the same vicinity to, to pick up on certain things. Hallelujah. So th in this year, we need to really, um, you know, we believe in God that we can get pe people back in. But here's, here's the thing I was at really after when I went down this whole line. We got people who are happy because they're still giving. Churches that are happy because they got financial uh, stability. And thank God we are financially stable. I am glad we're not going, you know, month to month going, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Because there's no money. Because we're not going back in debt. Been there, done that, threw the T-shirt in the fireplace as a fire starter. Hello. Never want to do that again. Be in that kind of, uh, of debt where it, it, it hangs over you like a, a um, millstone around your neck all the time. I mean, you can't even come into a church service without that being there because, you know, you're, you're so far in the hole. And it's like, what are we going to do if, if we don't get this amount of money this week? It's like this week, you go, okay. So half the church is gone. Woo! It's all great. And that's a wonderful place to be financially. But the satisfaction of not being together and being um, inspired and commissioned to go fulfill our purpose and calling has gotten lost in this. The government says we can't get together. The government says you can't be around people. The government says you've got to wear a mask. The government says you've got to be six foot apart. The government says, the government says, the government says. Well, the head of the church says go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen. So we have to have a stirring of the value and importance of going out and reaching people and bringing them in. Amen. <clears throat> so that was my side journey. And I'll tell you what we're going to do this week. We're going to end on the side journey. Okay? So next week, what we're going to do is we're going to pick up down in verse 5, okay, to the, where we add, now the word add, we'll give you this right here. I'm not going to give you the definition of virtue. Um, but add means to amply furnish and contribute nourishment to. So add to your faith. What's that? Furnish, amply furnish, and contribute nourishment to your faith by adding these other seven characteristics to your walk. Can you say amen? So that's where we're going to go next week in, in, in this uh, new series on Christian character. Hope you enjoyed this. Amen. Um, let's, did, we see, did we receive the offering? We just jumped right in and went after it, didn't we? <coughs> let's go ahead and receive our virtual offering. Hallelujah. Those in here in person, if you've got offerings, you know, you need an envelope, raise your hand. Uh, Brother Joe will bring that to you. If you need an envelope, if you're writing a check, obviously you can write it to the church. You don't have to put it in an envelope. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. So Jesse came up with that idea of um, monthly pledges. We can do $20.21, $202.10, or $2,021 for 2021. You know, all playing on the 2021 thing. So... That, that's, we'll just throw that out there. We're not, we're, we're, we're not there yet. Um, but you think about what you would, you would be willing to do, and we'll, we'll bring it up to you. But uh, maybe we'll do it in multiples of $20.21 per month. Okay? So, you know, uh, whatever. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Now, if you want to do $40.42 or $60.63 or $80.80, Four cents, or a hundred dollars and hundred one dollars, 
There we go. Two hundred and one dollars. Well, you know, we could keep going forever. All right. Hallelujah. Just think about that. See what you, you, know, you think you would do. Um, anyone in the envelope didn't get one? Let's pray. Hallelujah. Those watching in my line, you can go ahead and give us PayPal or Square Cash, the Square Cash app. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless the people as they tithe and give. Thank you that heaven's windows are opened unto them and that you right now pour out on them blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. All right, Brother Joe. And uh, as he's doing, once he finishes receiving the offering, if you will, we're going to receive the Lord's table. It's first Sunday of the month. Hallelujah. And we want you to go ahead and um, get ready to receive by um, getting up from where you are and um, coming down front, making a single line across the front. Um, if you're uncomfortable being close to somebody, space yourself out six feet over there to the side. Uh, otherwise, you know, stay with your families or whatever. But please get up and come on. Uh, they're going to be bringing the uh, communion uh, elements in here in just a moment. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Again, if you're, if you're uncomfortable being too close to people, just spread out away from them. Just kind of hold your hand out and, you know, say, stay away from me. There's room over here. Hallelujah. Praise God. Paul writing to the church at Corneth. Speaking in reference to um, their misuse of the Lord's table. But then he, uh, he comes back and says, As I received of the Lord that also which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and so Paul, you notice he says here, that which I had delivered unto you. So obviously they had, he had talked to them on the Lord's table before they didn't get it. And so he came back with a reproof and a correction. And he went as far as to say that there are people who don't rightly discern his Lord's body. And they're uh, sickly and many sleep. Let me give you uh, English modern day translation for King Jimmy sleep. Dead. Okay. It cost them their life not rightly discerning the Lord's body. We have to rightly discern G, what Jesus came for. Amen. Came to redeem us. Came to heal us. Came to make us one with the Father. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. So he took the bread and break it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Let us eat together the body of the Lord. Hallelujah. And he took the cup or Messiah's cup. He said, this cup is the New Testament, a new covenant in my blood. Do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We thank God for our covenant with God, sealed by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Redemption is ours through his precious blood. Let us drink together. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. You're washed by the blood. You're kept by the blood. You're healed by his body. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We will be back on Wednesday night streaming. Okay. Um, one of the things we're looking at for this year is getting people in the church to get either with Teams or Zoom. My wife says she thinks Zoom works better. Um, oh, it does. Okay. But us using Zoom to do a, a prayer service during the week. Um, and, I, and I want something where it's not just me on the Mevo praying, y'all sitting at home watching. I want it so that there can be interaction. We may, maybe we have everybody's microphone muted, 
but we can unmute it and you can interject. Okay, or just we say we're all going to pray together and, you know, kind of make it more of a corporate prayer atmosphere instead of you, you just on the other end listening. Okay, so um, is Zoom free? Okay, it's free. So, so it's a free software. You can put it on your, your, your tablet. You can put it on your phone. Um, you can turn your camera off. You can mute your audio. Um, so if you don't want to be seen, in other words, you've got curlers in your hair or you, really, you look really bad that day and don't want to be seen by the other prayer people, um, you can take a, a photo and have that up there for you. That um, the best one you've ever taken in your life, huh? You Photoshop it and everything. Glamour shots, you know. You, here's your glamour shots photo. You're looking good. Hallelujah. Um, but we're, we're, we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll get that. I, we are going to do it. It's not just a matter of if, if we are going to do it. It's just a matter of a timing and and so. Um, you may want to go ahead and download Zoom and start playing with it, how it's used. And then we would set up a group. And then that group with an invitation would go out for you to join that, that meeting. And, um, and then you could log in. We just don't want to, you know, I don't want to just open up everybody on the planet can come into our prayer service. Because sometimes you're praying about things you need to pray about as a closed group. And we, you know, even in electronic manners, we need to do that. What's wrong with people praying with us? Sometimes it's just the right thing to do is just to be us. And you can password protect it. So we can send you a password and say, you know, the church's password is, is our, our standard password is this. You know, and then you can join the, the meeting through your password. Okay? So um, we do need to pray about things. There's some, you know, I, and, and one of the things we'll be praying about is the church and its vision and our purpose that we must pray about. Amen. All right. Uh, have we got the um, presents for the folks that weren't here? Brother Joe's bringing them in. Okay. Who was not here? Oh, they're back here. If you were not here before Christmas, we have your Christmas gift from the church. Okay, so if we missed you for whatever reason. Oh, there's Brother Bill. He moved. I'm looking back there for Brother Bill. Hallelujah. We have that. We, we want you to come by and pick that up because we want you. Oh, oh, okay, there's. Well, my wife has got him now. And uh, see my wife. See my wife. And get your Christmas present. Amen. Hallelujah. Because if you don't get it, I'm going to gain some weight. Because we just can't let it go to bad. And it's stuff I like. You know, well, if you're going to give a gift, give something you need. Especially if it's food. Amen. Listen, you're not coming to my house and getting sushi. I ain't cooking something I don't like. I don't do raw fish. I don't care what you call it, cold cooking or, you know, coagulating the proteins through vinegar. Or I don't care what you call it. I ain't eating it. That's me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Um, we love you. We bless you. I'm excited about this series and where we're heading. Glory to God. Hope you got blessed today. Hallelujah. And those watching by Facebook, so glad you could join us today. I want you to remember these words from... 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. See you Wednesday night for Wednesday night Bible study. Praise the Lord. See you then.